we're going to explore Platonic philosophy in a different way than is usually presented. I've chosen for this evening the following subject, the present, the present of Platonic philosophy. I have four ideas, understanding, meditation, philosophical midwifery, and the dialectic. Now, I'm going to start talking about understanding and go through that list, and then I'm going to reverse it to show you the logic of it all. I have several quotes, and I think we can do well with what we have. I would have liked to have some more, but I got stalled in traffic. So let us pick it up from there. I'm going to start with the idea of understanding in Plato. Reference the symposium. There are four major ideas in Socrates' great speech in the symposium. Ignorance, right opinion, understanding, knowledge or wisdom. And he defines them because he has a goal, and the goal he is, he's going to develop a system of meditation contemplation. He's not going to explore philosophical midwifery on the level that we usually talk about it. We're going to explore it on a different level, and then we'll get to the need for the dialectic. So, to begin, consider a new way of looking at these four terms, or we won't have any trouble for the evening. Number one, ignorance. Ignorance is defined as the state of mind which, if you push the implications of the state of mind that you're in, there is no possible way you can hit the truth. Now, it doesn't mean you don't know 12 languages, have PhDs, have excelled in many noble courses of learning. It just means that whatever you have within you in terms of this quest for wisdom, you're not going to be able to hit the truth. That's ignorance. So, that's where we're going to start out, all right? The inability to hit the truth with the way in which you structure your view of the nature of reality. So, therefore, it's an inability, unable, let's call it, from that, an inability or unable to hit the truth. Now, if that's the condition, necessarily then, you're going to have to discover what is right, what is correct. Now that's an opinion. Now the way in which he talks about opinion is quite interesting and I can give you a quick little example of it. If you're proceeding along the road and you're not sure of the way and you stop off and see someone who knows the road and you say, excuse me, could you please tell me the road to San Francisco? And they say, oh yes, take that one over there and go. You'll follow the signs and you'll get there. And so you get there. Uh, on your way back, the same way, you reverse the road. You happen to stop in the same location, see the chap who offered you the directions, and you stop and you thank him very much. And you say, thank you for the directions who brought me to San Francisco. You must have traveled there yourself. No, he's never traveled there, no, no, never have. But I'm here so often giving people advice, I give them advice, and when they come back, occasionally, like yourself, they often thank me for the directions. Well then, you see, he has the right opinion, but he doesn't, he doesn't know anything other than it's fact that it's right. Now, in such a case, if you happen to have a map with you, and you say, look here, let me show you something, and you show him the map, he said, oh, I never looked at a map. He said, well, take a look at this map, and you can see that the advice you're giving is, in fact, there are good reasons for holding the position you're holding. He says, oh, good heavens, there are good reasons for holding the position I'm holding? I never knew that. Oh, yes, there are good reasons. Follow my finger along the map. He said, oh, now I understand. Now, he doesn't have knowledge, and so he says, you know, one day I would like to know whether there really is a place called San Francisco. 
And it looks like it says it's San Francisco up there following that little curious line. He says, but you know what? I don't know anything about the map maker and I didn't make the map myself and I don't even know if there is San Francisco. So look here, see these are stages then. If you're unable to hit the truth what you have, then you have to get the right opinion. If you get the right opinion, that doesn't mean you have the reasons. You, don't, you haven't yet grasped the reasons of why it is right. If you grasp the reasons, you must grasp the reasons why it is right. And once you grasp the reasons of why it is right, you now have left the realm of opinion. Now you have understanding. Now look here, <laughs> you have to do something therefore to move from this to this. You have to move something, you have to go from here to here and obviously you have to find, you have to take the journey yourself. You have to take the journey yourself in order to confirm the fact that you have grasped these reasons, but you have to confirm in your own experience what is being said is true. You have to understand the reasons that are being presented in defense of it is right, and the only way you can do that is to do your own seeing and your own experiencing, because would you not agree? No one sends a servant to a banquet to eat for them, and by heavens I doubt whether anyone would want to send someone else to do their own loving for them, right? You want to be there yourself, right? So, that's how we're now going to use understanding. All of this quick story is to tell you that we're using understanding, to say that you must grasp the reasons why whatever position you're holding is right, and it's right because that's the way you can hit the truth. And once you grasp those reasons, you have understanding, but you don't have knowledge since you haven't confirmed it your own experience. Okay, that's the way we're going to use that term. Now. You want to quickly push to this curious word. Now, there is a classic difference between, of course, meditation and contemplation, and the translators don't often follow that distinction. So I'll base it on Patanjali's yoga uh, aphorisms, aphorisms of Patanjali, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and I'll quickly just review it and then jump into, again, the symposium. Now. Accordingly, according to the classic distinction from Patanjali, which is very useful, if you can have an object, an internal or external, upon which to direct your consciousness or your attention, then that is attention. That is fixing your mind on an object. Now, look, just because you can fix your mind on the object, doesn't mean you can hold to it. Therefore, the, see, the continued fixing the mind on the object is meditation. The ability to merge with the object is contemplation. And at that point, there's a merging between the subject and the object. There's a merging, and that's the way we're going to use the word contemplation. Fair enough? All right. What's meditation? Fixing the mind on an object, and the continual fixing on that object is meditation. Therefore, uh, you can clearly see there isn't any difference in the object or the activity, it's just a different proficiency in holding the mind on the object. That's why, by the way, in uh, Patanjali's system, this is called a samyama. Yama, of course, means the study. So, some means together. When you, when you have the study that takes these things together, that is formally being a yoga. That's formally being a yoga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Good. We can use that term in that way now? All right. The reason I'm making this distinction between meditation and contemplation is because the works that I'm going to, to refer to for this evening 
don't make this distinction. They just have one word, contemplation, and they don't see that there are two processes, and that's why we're going to make this distinction now, so that we can make that distinction. Next, when you fix the mind on an object, meditation, that often means that you can bring to the object of your meditation a greater depth Right? a greater depth of understanding, using understanding the way we just did. That is, knowing the reasons why things can be said the way they can be said to support the contention that man can ultimately know the object of knowledge in such a perfect way that that can be called wisdom, which is what we're going to be after. All right, so, agree, understanding, meditation, ah curious thing called philosophical midwifery. Remember we said we're going to define philosophical midwifery in an unusual way. I think it's unusual, though it's quite obvious in Plato's dialogue, and therefore let's jump in. All right, here we go. Now, one of the, one of the quick ways to get into Plato is to see the difference between the natural and the ideal. So we're going to present the natural, and then we're going to shift it to the ideal. You keep in mind both, but you always keep your mind on the fact that the ideal is really what is functioning in the pursuit of understanding. So let me give an example that will therefore demonstrate this point through this idea of philosophical midwifery. As an example, here in this beautiful picture, pursuit. Ah, a fair damsel, right? And the object of his concern, without a doubt, love. Stage one. Stage two, by heavens, remarkable as it may seem, he is successful in his pursuit. And if we wanted to be careful about our language, of course, we would say, he no longer loves, he no longer loves in step number two, because love is seeking the object of your desire, and he's got the object of his desire, and therefore this is really love-ing, the activity of it. As a consequence, as this strange story proceeds, though it has some parallels in the natural world, Familiar with that stage in human experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, good, 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 good. Fourth stage. We're going to call this the, the, the maturation, the raise, the nurture, nurture and development. Clearly, clearly, you can see this is the stage of pregnant. This is conceiving, and this is seeking the object of one's desire. We're calling this the natural. Now, as we say in Plato, there's always the natural and the ideal, but the ideal always takes a curious twist, and you have to watch that curious shift in order to grasp what Plato is doing. And so, I'll quickly do that. All right. This is the level of the body. The parallel process is in the soul, and therefore you can see in this beautiful picture a soul in hot pursuit of something called beauty. Necessarily, following this model then, it must follow that here the soul gets into it. And here, he gets into her, and she lets him get into her, right? Because in the Platonic dialogue, in the symposium, this word is playing such a major role in, in. All love 
it's not love is not for the beautiful, but for bringing to birth, for, for conceiving, bringing bringing birth in the beautiful. In it's always in in the beautiful. Now for this process, therefore, you can see with my superior talent in art, what normally isn't seen in most art museums, a pregnant soul. Doesn't it look like a pregnant soul? Right? Yeah, so I admire my own beauty. Beautiful, that is beauty of the work, right? Now look here, would you not agree if this follows naturally now, we're going to have to have something that comes to birth and there must be a maturation, a nurturing, and a development of whatever that is. Now what is the birth of the soul? So what is the birth of the soul? All right, now. This is the way it appears, see? This is the way it appears. And there's a certain way in which you can read Plato where this is there. But what he is saying, while this appears to be the case, there's an ideal level. And that's, this is the ideal level. One, all men, all men are in fact uh, pregnant. All men are pregnant. It's not that we have to become pregnant. We're all pregnant. We're all pregnant already. That's man's problem. He is already pregnant and he doesn't know it. Therefore, mankind being pregnant, and when I say man, of course, I always mean mankind, generic, right? Man then doesn't recognize his problem, that he's pregnant. He doesn't realize that a good part of the pain and the travail that he goes through is because he's pregnant. And therefore, he must really be brought to a midwife. Now, Socrates' mother was one of the great midwives, and he says in the Theotetus, my art, he says, my art, my philosophy is nothing other than being a philosophical midwife. It's because I can tell man's pregnancy, I can see at what stage it's at, and he said, just like my mother, I can help him, I can help that person bring to birth the child of their, of their mind. For all men are pregnant in the soul. All mankind, all man, all men are pregnant. And when they reach a certain age, they want to give birth. They want to beget, and they don't know how to do it. So they have to seek someone who has that kind of skill. And this is the philosophical midwife. This is the Socratic figure. That's his badge. And this person then can recognize two things. Not only are they pregnant and ready to give birth, he says, but the highest art, the highest level of my art is be able to judge whether or not what is being born is a true and noble birth or whether it should be aborted. And he says, that's my art. That's the high point in my art. He said, so I go around talking to men and I see that they're about ready to give birth. They don't know it. And he says, so I try to help them bring to birth the ideas that they have long been pregnant with. And he said, some of them are vicious and angry and they get very, very upset because they want to keep the child that they've labored with. And he says, it's a terrible thing. We must abort it. He said, that's where all the problems come in. He said, but some, they give a true and noble birth. Then he says, the second part, the higher part, of the post, the post, of the, the, the post process, is that I then have to help them bring it up, okay? bring it up, nurture it. Now, what is that? What is that? So, we're going to leave that at this moment as a question here, and we're going to say the same question is here. That is. When a man is in truly pregnant and he has a true and noble birth ahead of him and he's assisted in this noble birth, such then that he can, he can bring it to birth and it's judged to be true and noble, what, what is it that he must then do to it? Ah, there's our question, there's our question. I wanted to go back to the other part. Remember I said we're dealing with two parts. 
the natural, what appears, and the ideal. This is the ideal. This is the ideal. He said, some men, they think that their condition requires them to seek fame and fortune, and so they spend their lives energy seeking fame and fortune because they think that's really what they've been pregnant with, and that's what they have to give birth, and so they spend their lives in such, fo in such pursuits. He said, but there are some, there are some, he says, who recognize that they really are pregnant, and they're pregnant with something. What they're pregnant with is a divine birth. Because man, in the Platonic world, is half human, half divine. There's something about man that's divine. That's the soul. That's the soul. And he's in a body. Therefore, he often judges things by its appearance in the natural world. And that's the problem. That's the problem. We don't recognize that there's something about us that is divine, and the soul has indeed conceived, you see? In other words, starting it on this level now, on the ideal level, not the way it appears, these two stages precede man's birth. Man already comes into being. He's already had this experience which is what? Which is conceiving in beauty. And now he's pregnant. Therefore, one, two, three. This is man's condition as he exists here. So we walk around and we're pregnant. We don't know that we're pregnant. One, two, three. We start out, therefore, at stage four. We seek a midwife, five. We then have to go through the process, six. Then we have to discover what is it we're giving birth to, for heaven's sakes, and what does this nurture and development mean? Seven, seven stages, you see. Well, what he wants to make clear is what you have to do to go through this process. All right, here we are. One, two, three. You're pregnant. We're all pregnant. We're all pregnant. One, two, three. He wants to now make clear this process. Now, I'm only going to talk about the process, not the result. So therefore, I'm going to call this the process. This here is going to be the result. What I mean by right here, I mean the child that comes to birth through this process. Now, what is that process whereby a person is, is already pregnant and, and full and waiting to give birth? What is that process? What are the stages? What are the steps? And how do you do it? All right. Here we go. In Plato's symposium, in Socrates' speech, this is the part, of course, that, where all this comes together. In Socrates' speech in the symposium, he explores everything we've said, everything we've said, he explores. And when he finishes it, what he has done is brought us to a level of understanding. We've reached a level of understanding. We know that we're pregnant. We know we need a midwife. We know we have to go through a process of birthing. And therefore, I'm now going to talk about the last uh, um, I should talk about the last four paragraphs in Socrates' speech. There are 12 paragraphs in the whole thing. Uh, if you use the uh, Rouse translation, and the great dialogues of Plato. And the 12, each one has interrelation with the other parts, much like a very good tapestry. You know, all the threads of meaning go in and out and weave a fantastic thing. So what we're going to now take a look at is several of the figures. Now, let this represent chapter, the fourth paragraph, the third, the second, so therefore, in terms of the work itself, 
this would be the 12th, this would be the 11th, this would be the 10th, this would be the 9th paragraph. So we're going to take those four. Now, what I'm going to do is skip the first, you see. I'm going to skip the first. So you're going to wonder why I'm skipping the first, and maybe that'll hang you there and hold your attention for a while, all right? All right? Clever? Now, I'm not going to tell you because I'd be giving it away. There's another reason. He gives us the reason, he gives us that curious answer of what gives birth in two places. And it's most essential that you understand the significance of it, and you only get that in the third. So that's why I'm doing it. All right, okay, quickly. So Diotima is Socrates' teacher. A woman. Right. Socrates' teacher was a woman, Diotima of Mantinea. And she initiates Socrates into this great game called philosophy. And she finally reaches the point where she says, now, dear Socrates, she says, I don't know whether you're going to be able to do it or not. So I don't know whether you're going to be capable of doing it, but if, I'll tell you what it's like. And they have this kind of fun through the whole dialogue of joking with one another. Oh, I don't know whether you'll be able to do it. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you won't. Or, oh, cool, let me try. And so they play that way. So that's the way it starts here. She says, I don't know whether you'll be an adept at it or not, but I'll tell you what it is like to be initiated into the mysteries. So now we get this great thing. And everything I say, of course, is going to come right out of the speech, the language, and everything else. So she says, look here, you must start out young. He says, when you start out young, he says, you're in, if your instructor leads you aright, you must go out and seek out those beautiful bodies. And obviously my art is so superior. As you can see, all my figures are both beautiful and nude. Did you notice that? All my figures are nude. Yeah. He says, what you, what the, if the instructor leads you aright, he says, you have to make love to a beautiful body. You have to make love to one body. And then create, now this is going to go through several changes, going to go through several changes for, as a matter of fact, so you must create beautiful speech. So the loving, right, the loving must follow creating beautiful speech that attends it and is part and parcel of it. Then he says, look here, if you're then, he said, if you've been, been, been pursuing properly, so then you don't want to love just one, you must love them all. And in the old days, you know, they had these chariots that run through Athens, and they had bumper stickers on the chariots, love them all. And that's where the expression comes from. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, it was a very, po very popular thing in those days, right? So he says, love them all. Right? And he says, now you even have to go beyond that. He said, now... You must now look for those that are just, just possess a little bloom physically, but have beautiful souls. And he says, you must love them now. He says, you must learn how to love a beautiful soul. So now we have that opportunity, therefore, to draw another soul. All right. And he says, now, you, now he takes this idea and pushes it another step. He says, now you have to create such talks that will make young people better. You must develop talks, you must engage in talks, such that will make young people better. Next stage. Now, what you see from this, you see, is going to be an inclusive, it's going to go from a particular individual, stage one here, to all physical bodies, right, to include See, it's inclusive. Next stage. Not only physical bodies, but beautiful souls. Com becomes more, more, more comprehensive and includes more. He says, then you know what you have to do? He says, you then have to be, uh, now this is where he brings in this idea of contemplation. It's really a, uh, meditation rather than contemplation. He says, then, then he says, what you have to do is, you have to then contemplate the beauty of our pursuits and customs. Right. So now, right, now he's moving it wider. Right. Now you have to see the beauty in our laws and our customs and our practices. You have to see the beauty in that too. 
He says, then what's most interesting, he says, now you have to be compelled to contemplate, right? You have to be compelled to contemplate the, the beauty and different kinds of knowledge. Now that's the kind of a college you want to go to. You don't want to go to a college where you just learn something, but you want to be able to, you can't pass, can't get out of the course unless you can demonstrate that you see the beauty and different kinds of knowledge. If you can't do that, you don't know it. So therefore, right, pursuits and customs, different kinds of knowledge. Then he says, when you've reached that stage, there's an additional, most interesting stage he said, now, since you have experience of beauty, becoming more and more embraceive, he says, now you, have, you now have to learn, you now have to contemplate that great ocean of beauty, which you've now gone through, steps all, it becomes more and more embraceive. You now have to contemplate that great ocean of beauty, and then you have to give birth, see, different, see, this is giving birth to talks that will make young people better. This is creating beautiful speech. This is giving birth to beautiful speech. Second, third. Now you have to create such, right? you, you have to then, it's bring to birth, another bringing to birth. Many thoughts and speeches in the abundance of philosophy. And the abundance of philosophy. For what purposes? He said, so then you can gain strength. You can gain strength. Right? You can gain strength for the insight. See, you have to gain strength. Right? You have to gain strength and, and uh, uh, a certain degree of power in order then to get an insight into the nature of beauty in itself. So what do you do? You, well, you do a different kind of birth. Now you bring to birth many magnificent thoughts and speeches and the abundance of philosophy. What does that do? That has a corresponding effect on you. It builds you up, makes you stronger, makes you more secure. Right? That's right. Meditation. See, that's really meditation. That's what meditation does. That's what meditation does. It's not contemplation. That's meditation. And that's why I needed it. Now, he said, because you will then reach a point where suddenly, and he uses that great word, suddenly you will see a vision marvelous in its nature, right? Suddenly you'll see a vision marvelous in its nature, which only the mind can see, he says. Only the mind can see it. Nothing else can see it because it's seeing into the nature of reality. And now he gives a great description of this great thing. This vision into the nature of what we call ultimate reality. Now, he calls it the perfection of beauty. The perfection of beauty. And he says, there alone, there alone for man when he contemplates that, does he discover the meaning or the purpose of life? He says, that's, that's, what, that's what you do. Want to, want to know about it? He says, okay, that's a perfection of beauty. That's it. And in that moment, then you recognize the purpose of life, the significance of life, and that's what life is all about. He says, but you know what? He says, here's, what, here's the important part. Now he says, you know what? At that moment, and the, the, the words he uses, you touch, you touch the nature of reality. You touch the nature of reality. Which only the mind can see. And what do you get from that? Then he says something significant, of course. He says, then from that point you can say that the person who's achieved that becomes a friend of God and immortal if any man ever is. Because in that experience, you see, he discovers, when he touches the nature of reality, that it's any different the nature of himself. He recognizes, therefore, in that perfect vision 
of the nature of reality, what he's discovering is the nature of his own reality, or the nature of reality, not his own. There's no more of his around to, to uh, talk about possession. And therefore, that's what he goes. And now he says, you know what you do? You, you, uh, uh, you must bring it up, nurture. You must bring, what must you bring up? You see, out of this experience, something is brought up. And I'd like to just read you one line because I like to read it. And it's a nice quote, very simple quote. And then I'm going to go back to that first paragraph and link the two of them together. Remember we said we we're gonna hold that back, okay. This is Diotima, his teacher, talking. She said, this is the conclusion then of the 11th paragraph. Do you not reflect that there only it will be possible for him when he sees the beautiful with the mind which alone can see it to give birth not to likenesses of excellence since he touches no likeness, but to realities since he touches reality. And when he has given birth to real excellence and brought it up, will it not be granted to him to be a friend of God and immortal if any man ever is? Well, there's something rather curious. As a result of that, a certain excellence emerges and it has to be brought up. Now, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Have real excellence you have to be brought up. You have to bring it up. You have to nurture it. Out of this, out of this, there is something then that comes to birth and according to this game, you're supposed to then nurture and bring it up. Ah, remember we get into here, it's curious first, okay. Now Plato is a very curious writer. You have to be so careful when you read him you have to carry along so much with you. You have to carry levels of meaning with you in order to see and appreciate what he's saying. So let, let's do it. We can do it quickly. I think we can do it. What are we going to try to do? I'll put it in here. We have that curious problem about when the soul is pregnant. Right? the soul is pregnant, there must be something that must then be brought to birth and it must be nurtured, right, it must be nurtured and brought up. Now what is that excellence which must be nurtured and brought up, brought to birth? What is he talking about, this excellence? What is it? What kind of curious thing is this? What, what kind of excellence is he talking about? Of course, he's talking about human excellence, of course, but what kind of excellence? Because with that success, you become a friend of the gods and immortal if any man ever can be said to be so. Well, watch what he says. And I really enjoy sharing this with you because it's such a magnificent idea, kind of the crowning, one of the crowning passages in Plato. He describes the relationship between a teacher, a diatema, describes the relationship between a teacher and student. Now she is the teacher and he is the student. And now, in this paragraph, she's going to review and she's going to give a kind of summary view of where all of this goes, and she's going to talk about that very point. It's only going to be done in one sentence, and you have to stay with it to see it. So, let, let me read okay. Now, uh, before we do that, just one thought. We can have fun with this if we see there's something similar in our culture. 
here are the works of Homer, Hesiod. Now, these two great authors, of course, are the founders of different spiritual systems within the Homeric world, over than the Greek world. So these are sacred scriptures. Rather, they're reflected upon, they're looked upon, they're venerated, they're, they're sought as examples to reflect upon, and they serve that purpose in Greek culture. Just like in our culture, not too many people read Homer, but today they read things like the Bible, the Tao Te Ching, right, the Gita, the Koran. So while I go through this and he talks about this, your mind goes to both levels. I'll, I'll just back up just one sentence. Just so. the trouble with his sentences at this point is that they go, they, they're, they're quite, quite involved. But um, being pregnant, then see the, the, the student is pregnant. Being pregnant, then we're picking up the language we had before. Being pregnant, then he welcomes bodies which are beautiful rather than ugly. If he finds a soul beautiful, generous, well-bred, he gladly welcomes the two, body and soul, together. And for a human being like that, he has plenty of talks about excellence and what the good man ought to be into practice, and he tries to educate him. Now, here we go with our one sentence. It's about eight lines. For by a Attaching himself to a person of beauty, I think, and keep in company with him, he begets and procreates what he has long been pregnant with. He begets and procreates, pro to, 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 to generate it out. Huh? And present and absent, he remembers him. And with him fosters what is begotten. See, begetting, fostering, nurturing, development, right? language is there. So that as a result, these people maintain a much closer communion together and a firmer friendship than parents of children, because they have shared between them children more beautiful and more immortal. Here we are now. And everyone would be content to have such children born to him rather than human children. He would look to Homer and Hesiod and the other good poets and wish to rival them who leave behind such offspring behind them, which give, the, which give their parents the same immortal fame and memory as they themselves have. So, wait a minute, let's go back. What's born? There's some kind of a child born, isn't it? Right, that's the language he's using. There's a child, right? There's some kind of a child, some kind of a child. There it is, some kind of a child. Everyone would be content to have such children born of him rather than human children. Why he would look to he would look to Homer and Hesiod and wish to rival them. Now if someone wants to if two teams, if there's a rivalry well, what, is, what kind of relationship is, he, is being described with that term? Is this saying that the child of their relationship, of course, this person's already pregnant, right? He's already pregnant. He, this person, his diatima is the midwife, is the philosophical midwife. The child then of that relationship, the child, right, that child, I shouldn't say of their relationship because I mean in that other sense of relationship, the relationship with the, with the midwife assists the pregnant party to give to birth. So there's the, there it is, a beautiful picture of the pregnant soul. In that, therefore, this is the child. And therefore, this person, Socrates in this case, considering the child, 
would then nurture it and bring it up because he thinks he can do what? Wish to rival them means? Means you're going to do what if you're going to rival them? Pardon? It's a competition. Going to be in competition with them and hopefully beat them down, beat them up, or go beyond? Mm -hmm. No. Really? Wait a minute, that means then when this work was written by Plato, he could see that this whole process we're talking about is going to bring into existence a child of their relationship that's going to rival Homer and Hesiod. It's going to rival, rival the sacred scriptures of that age. And he could see it, that's what he said. Ah! Hmm. Now what is that experience? What is that experience that when you proceed in this way through what we now call philosophy, which is an understanding of how all of this goes on, you move from ignorance, you get the right answers, you now know the reasons for the right answers, and how you want to confirm it in your own experience. That's this, ins that's this, see? That's that, suddenly you will behold a beauty marvelous in, in its nature, Socrates, beyond that which you have ever seen, right? We need to take a look at that. What is that, and how does that then relate to our last category called the dialectic, right? All right, ready? This is all background for this part. Now, uh, I don't want to use that yet. Where this? Yeah, okay. Okay. Now look here, if this is a way in which men can be brought to have such a vision through the mind alone, such that it can rival the religious traditions of a whole age, how are men then, how are men, how are men, notice the language, to be brought up, nurtured, developed, to be brought up, such that they can endure, endure, that's why you need strength, right? How are such men to be brought up such that they can then engage in such a magnificent uh, pursuit and endure such a profound experience? Now, now we're shifting to the Republic because that's where the dialectic is. Now after the allegory of the cave in the upper world, he concludes with this great statement. He says, now we have to ask, how are such men, right? How such men are to be produced? Now, of course, this is in, in a city, that's the Republic. And how shall they be brought up? Notice the language, the language is exactly the same kind of language we are using before, isn't it? Brought up, nurtured, developed, just to make sure. How are such men to be produced? How shall they be brought up? Now, here's where he shifts into the light, as you know, some are said to go up from Hades to heaven. That's the language. Which, in the, in, of course, the, their view of Hades is different than our view of hell, but it's the afterworld. The distance between these two terms, the full range of human experience, the totality of all human experience in term, in expre expressed in the extremes, they would call those two extremes Hades and heaven. That's the way they talk about it. And therefore, when he gives the allegory of the cave in the upper world, of course, the cave is at the depths, and that's the Hades. And the world in the upper world is like being likened to heaven. Now, here's the word he's using. All right, like, light, light, light. Ah, we shift. Need a new diagram out of the symposium into the Plato's Republic. The question we want to pursue now is, what kind of experience is it that is called the perfection of beauty?
which again is called gaining a vision into the nature of reality. So that's what we want to know. Is it possible to say, well, well, well there's one image that's being used, light. Now in the allegory of the cave, as you undoubtedly know, right, there's a fire here in the cave, and there's a wall where men walk back and forth with a raised parapet, and they carry objects on their heads, and the objects on their head then ca are uh, produced on the wall of the cave as shadows, and men are chained here for their, they've been there since childhood, and they take that to be reality. They take that to be reality. That's the way Socrates says it. They take that to be a reality. And therefore he says, you know what you have to do? You have to take one of these people, release them from their chains, because they're chained, it's like a prison. You, see, you have to stand them up. You've got to stand them up, release them from the chains. And you have to, by questions, get them to see that what they formerly took to be reality is not reality at all, but nothing other than these shadows. By the, pardon me, it's not the shadows, the origin of the shadows are the objects being carried on the men's heads. They have to see that, and they have to see that what's produced that is a light behind them, a natural fire. He said, now when that happens, they are terribly confused and puzzled, and they prefer to go back into their old existence content. He said, but what if we were then to take them and force them up that difficult and steep ascent into the upper world? Then what would it be like? He says, well, it's like in two, there are two stages up there. One is that so overwhelming experience of light, radiance, that they have to be brought up there in two stages. They first have to be brought up at night so they can get used to the upper world and then never look at the source of the light but to look at the reflections now in surfaces like water and lakes and things of that nature so they can get used to the objects because then when they're used to the objects and reflected in such, such shiny surfaces, they can then turn at last and take a look at what produced them. And that, of course, is the nature of the sun, right? the sun in the upper world. Now look here, look curious, see? This ascent into real being, this is now called real being, we shall say is true philosophy. This is the ascent, the journey of the soul, remember what we called it, from Hades to heaven, that's the ascent into real being. That's the ascent into, real being of course is what is, nature what is, ultimate reality, what is. So, this ascent into real being, that's what we shall call, and that's what we'll say is true philosophy. That's philosophy, it has nothing to do with anything else. Right? That's, that's philosophy. Now he has this most splendid statement. This is the statement where he looks over the whole thing, and I'm going to see if I can invite you to see it on two levels. There's two parts of it, I broke it up into two. Now he looks at this whole allegory of the cave in the upper world and he says that in the world of the known, the world of the known, now this is the world of the known, because uh, the realm of understanding and knowledge, this is the realm of the known. The ascent is the level of understanding. So that in the world of the known, the upper world, last of all is the idea of the good. Well, last of this, last thing to be seen is this. And with what toil to be seen, because there's a whole practice of contemplation, meditation, training of the soul for that vision. And then seen, once seen, this must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all. Now notice what that idea of the good does.
this must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all. Now notice this, which gives birth, which gives birth to light, and the king of light in the world of sight. Now wait a minute, what does that mean? That idea of the good then is the cause of light. It gives birth to light. Look here. This gives birth to this idea of the good gives birth to light. That idea. And, and the king of light. What's the king of light? The sun. It gives two births. The literal, the literal, <clears throat> the literal sun in the heavens. So he's saying, hey, look here. In this game of philosophy, what you want to do then is to see the nature of reality. The nature of reality is nothing other than that perfection of beauty which is seen in a vision which the mind alone can see it. You see that, that's equivalent in the allegory of the cave, in the allegory of the cave in the upper world, to the sun, which then is called, in this game, what is it called? The idea of the good. Now there's a general confusion about what an idea means, but it won't be any confusion for us, because what they mean by an idea is simply not an idea, and therefore we won't have any trouble with it. Because the word idea is a Greek word. That's, that's the word, idea. What it means in Greek, if we were to translate what it means and not use that word, because we confuse that word, that word with a thought or a concept. It's not. An idea is nothing other than the, the idea to behold. That's right, to behold. So if you behold the good, to behold the good, and the good is the ultimate, the ultimate term in Greek philosophy, to behold the good, that is the idea of the good. It ain't the good, what is it? It's to behold it. It's not the good, to behold it. Now, look here. If this is the case, let's see if we can get back into this and take a look and look at this, structure this out. That's really curious, you see. It looks like the idea of the good, right, then, right, gives birth to, in the world of sight, light, and the king of light, which is the sun, right? Well, look here. If the idea of the of the idea of the good to behold the good, if you can, hey, you know what that is? That gives birth to light. That's the cause of light. It's also the cause of the sun itself. Well, if that's the case, then there must be the good, sometimes called the one. Then how does it relate, and what does it relate to? Unfinished. Oh, that's because we have to turn the page. Right. See, which gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. Therefore, this clearly is the world of the visible, world of sight. Well then, there's also huh, the world of, world of the mind. Huh, curious. World of the known, that's the world of the mind. Wow, oh, okay. Luckily enough, there's the idea. All right, same, notice parallel, parallel language, right? Therefore, as the world of sight is to the idea of the good, so the world of the mind must be to the good. Now that's what he says, look here. 
And in the world of mind herself, the queen, the queen? Yeah, we have a queen. We have a king and queen then. Look here. There's a king. There's the king and the light. If this is the king, what would the light be then in this world? King and queen, right? That'd be the queen. Yeah, right, 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 right. I agree with you entirely. Right. Well, then in the world of mind, there's got to be two things. One called the you know what, and the other called the other what? Right. King and queen, right? Must have parallel structures. And we're going to now figure out, well, hey, which is which? Uh-oh, wait a minute. And in the world of mind herself, hey, the idea of the good is, is feminine. It's herself. Ah. Then the idea of the good, this then must be the world of the mind. Because this is herself. Well, look here then. And in the world of mind herself, the queen produces truth and reason. That's what it does. By heavens. Then this idea of the good, which in the visible world produces light and the sun, is capable, is capable of producing both truth and reason. Well, if that's true then, as the idea of the good is capable of producing light and the sun in our visible world, in the world of mind, it produces truth and reason. Same analogy, structurally, same point. Good, good, that's easy to see. And must be seen by one who is to act with reason, both publicly and privately. It has to be seen. But you know what? We don't yet have what this is. Uh-oh, another, another question. Now well, we got rid of one. Maybe we can get rid of the other. Let's go back then. That reaching into beholding the good itself, to behold the good in itself, is called the idea of the good. All right. Why? Because to behold the nature of reality is what they would call to behold the nature of the good. Ah. <coughs> well then, if to behold the nature of the good is the idea of the good, then how do these two relate? Well, from what we saw before, now we're on the realm of experience. Now we're on the realm of experience. Let's push that now, all right? Here we go. World of sight, world of mind, uh, realm of experience. Let's go back. This sent into real being, we shall call true philosophy. Oh, didn't I? No, no. Here it is. Come on. How are such men to be produced in the city, and how shall they be brought up into the light? This experience, the idea of the good, is the luminosity the most, what is called, the most brilliant light of being. The word being, of course, in this game is synonymous with the nature of reality. So therefore, in the realm of experience, this person who goes up those steps and has that culminating vision, in the realm of experience, that would be experienced as a divine luminosity as the most brilliant light of being. That's an overwhelming experience of beauty itself. This is an overwhelming experience of beauty itself. Oh, wait a How can there be anything higher than that? We're, we're off. We have to be off. There's something wrong. From this, with reason, of course, and the development of reasoning, and everything then that has proceeded from ignorance to right opinion to understanding to knowledge, you now can see the role of reason. You now see that you have to train the mind in order to have this vision. Well, that must be the ultimate. But if that's the ultimate, then there's no role for the good. Right, she can be, the idea of the good can be called the queen. Okay, we'll put that in, idea of the good. 
All right, put that in. But what's the king then? The good? Yeah, okay, what can we say about him? Doesn't fit, nothing here for the good. That's a failure. It's a failure. Or, we need the dialectic. We only need the dialectic. We only need the dialectic because of this problem. Let's see if we can get the problem. All right, the problem is, in this overwhelming experience, which can be called samadhi, nirvana, can take on all of those great names, either there is something higher than this, and through a dialectic we might be able to see it, or this is the ultimate turn and there's no need for the dialectic at all or unless we call dialectic logic. So, let's see how we can approach this. Luckily enough, I have one other page. But before I put it up here, let me see whether we can bring ourselves together in this quest. We started with this vision of ignorance, right opinion, understanding, knowledge or wisdom. We see the need now for confirming understanding in this kind of a vision. This kind of a vision produces an insight into the nature of ultimate reality. It can be called the perfection of beauty. Uh, subjectively, how is it described in terms of, uh, of, of uh, phenomena, as it were, phenom phenomenologically, how might it be described? It can be described, therefore, as that luminous, overwhelming experience of beauty itself. Divine radiance is equally a convenient term to describe it. Now, this is called, from what we've been developing, the idea of the good. Using the, uh, the word idea as to behold. Our question now is, is there something beyond that? Yes, there would be immersed in not beholding it, but being it. But in that experience, boy, he's in it, right? <laughs> he's in it. And therefore it fits the term of contemplation. So there's there's, there's, a, there's a total identity here between the two. Man recognizes in this the nature of himself and the nature of reality is one, no difference. Why isn't that sufficient? Now, the whole work of the Republic, the whole work of the Republic has this as its goal. And it has secondary goals, of course, because he says that there are many people who reach this state and they think that's sufficient and they think they're in the islands of the blessed and they don't want to do anything more and they don't want to come down and help mankind and they're content and they stay there. And they, and they, that, from, they we must never let that happen in our state. Yeah, go ahead. The next stage is to be the midwife. Ah, that's right. We got a new stage in the midwife. That stinker is coming back. <laughs> so, now we're going to shift now in the work called the Parmenides. All right, that's where we're going. Now, Republic and Parmenides. <clears throat> What's the problem? The problem is that some people who reach that, they think they have reached the ultimate. They have reached the ultimate. They therefore stay there. They have nothing to do with society. They're willing to stay there for the rest of their lives in such idyllic states. And he says, but we must never allow that to happen in our just state now. Just state, of course, means, of course, a just soul, the soul itself. Therefore, uh, in the development of the ideal state, it's nothing, of course, other than developing the ideal soul. So there must be something beyond for the soul mm -hmm. than this experience, or the whole thing falls apart. Right. Well, luckily enough, I happen to brought the book with me, and I can read quickly a couple of pages. But before I do it, actually just uh, uh, two sentences. Uh, 
What we are now asking is why is there a need for the dialectic and what does the dialectic do? Another way of putting that is the idea that good brings to birth both uh, truth and reason. Dialectic is going to use that kind of reason. Now the only thing we have that, uh, that we can proceed from is just this one notion that in this system the good <clears throat> can be called the one. The reason why, of course, there are two names is that all men desire the good. Anything that man desires, he only desires it because it, he thinks for himself that it's good. He may be mistaken about what he calls good, but the, no matter who we are, if we have any life in us at all, we only want to seek what we think will bring us good. And that's the driving power behind all mankind, that's all. Now, on the other side, the thing that he desires most perfectly can also be described in other terms than the fact that he wants it and perceives it as good for himself. And that is, we can perceive it as a pure one. That's all we have, and now we're going to see whether or not we can come to this reflection. All right, this certain kind of reflection we want to engage in to see whether we can go beyond this with a certain kind of reflection called the dialectic to see whether or not there's something beyond this, and if so, does it deserve the name of the one which then is the good? That's where we're going. Right. Okay. What's remarkable about the Parmenides is its, its simplicity. You can never be confused about any sentence. You can always be confused about how the sentences link one together, one, one another together, but you can never be mistaken about what he says in any one sentence. <laughs> so, all right. Now we want to see whether or not I'm going to go there to the Parmenides, I'm going to make that point, but before I do that, I want those two sentences out of the Republic, which I now want to read in order to make the transition to the Parmenides. All right, here we go. Um, I think I've had this book so long that I should just leave it and it should open up to the page by now. You know. <laughs> so, but I'll have to, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, well, let me sneak in a third sentence, all right, because I just saw a good one. All right. Then it is the task of us, the founders, to compel the best natures to attain that learning, which we said was the greatest, both to see the good and to ascend that ascent. And when they have ascended and properly seen, we must never allow them to do what is allowed now. Good heavens, what's that? to stay there and not be willing to descend again to those prisoners and share their troubles and their honors, whether they're worth having or not. We must never allow them to do what is allowed now. What's there? To stay there, see, to stay there. We must never allow them to stay there. The whole book is about this one problem. Okay, now. Uh, Yeah, okay, okay, I'm on the wrong page. Okay. Um. 
the dialectic method proceeds alone by this way, demolishing the hypotheses as it goes back to the very beginning itself in order to find firm ground. The soul's eye, which is really buried deep in a sort of barbaric bog, it draws out quietly and leads upward, having the arts we've described as handmaids and helpers. These we've often termed sciences from habit, but they need another name, one clearer than opinion, dimmer than knowledge. We've defined it somewhere already, but understanding, so that's what he calls it, understanding. Okay, now I'm gonna go a step further, what does he do? This is just one, well, this is a part of one sentence. The dialectic method proceeds alone by this way, demolishing the hypotheses as it goes back to the very beginning itself. That's, that's all he says about the dialectic in book seven. I'm in book six. By the way, for those of you interested in the reference, that's at uh, um, 533 is the Tophanus number or page 333 in the Rouse. Now, I'm in book six at uh, page 311 or the Rouse uh, 511, approximately 511, Stephanus number. Now then, understand that by the other part of things which, of things thought, I mean, what the arguing process itself grasps by the power of dialectic treating assumptions not as beginnings, but as literally hypotheses. That's to say, steps, springboards for assault, from which it may push its way up to the region free of assumptions. What do we have to do? We have to push our way free of assumptions and reach the beginning of all, and grasp it clinging again and again to whatever clings to this and so may come down to a conclusion without using the help of anything at all that belongs to any of the senses, but only the ideas themselves. And passing through ideals, it may end in ideals. By the way, this is the response to it. I understand, though not sufficiently, for you seem to me to describe a very heavy task but I see that you wish to lay down that a clearer perception of real being and the world of mind is given by the knowledge of dialectic. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now, what are we going to do? We're going to look for assumptions. We're going to look for assumptions. We're going to look for assumptions. All right, now we're going to look for assumptions and see whether by this we can unmask them and if we have any assumptions, of course, we haven't reached what we want to reach, which is a, a pure idea, a pure reason. Now, would you agree so far that we can say someone experiences that? Let's go further and say something that all the great Roshis have said many places. And that is in such an experience, one is capable of penetrating it infinitely. One can go into it in more and more in profound depths. It is capable of being realized more profoundly. Whatever experience you've had, it will be profound. It's capable of profound depths. And you know one thing about it, and that is that it truly is the nature of ultimate reality. You know, that's what really is reality, see? Another word for it. Now look here, whether we like it or not, would you not agree, strictly speaking, strictly speaking, just if we just stay with those two ideas, whether we like it or not, we are obliged to say that this thing that has been experienced, if it doesn't have separable parts, at least one can at least talk about distinctions within it, profounder, and that it is. So, 
if it is, it has a certain class of parts. Not parts that are breaking apart, but you can have distinctive parts. You, right? If it is, we'll make it more exalted and put a capital there, right? If it is, it has distinctive parts or aspects of it or attributes or in any case plural well then in that experience then there's nothing else but that so in that respect if there's one name over the whole thing therefore it has a unity it's a whole not in the sense that I have three pieces of chalk but perhaps the kind of unity that comes when you talk about the parts of a symphony. They don't have parts like this, but you can make distinctions between them. So, if it is a whole, it has a unity, and if it has a unity, it has parts, if it has parts, then in some way we can do some other things with it. We can say, you know what we can say about this? We could also say, could we not, that there's something about this that we know it's like. It is like, in some degree, in some degree, like light. I mean, because that's the language, radiance, brilliance. Therefore, this experience is, in fact, like something else. Oh, by the way, equally well, that experience is other than everything else, isn't it? Isn't it, Liz? Yeah, it must be other than everything else because there's nothing else like it in that pure sense. Though there is something that is similar to it, like, like, radiance, like, because it's not the same thing. But there's something about it that's similar. We wouldn't use the same term. Huh. Well, to some degree then, we can say this thing is a whole, it has unity, it can be like something, right? And therefore we can use the idea of some and other. And by the way, are we not obliged to say equally well there must be other things if that is? Since other things are different from that. So therefore we can also say it's different from other things, can we not? Different and other? Yeah. It can be known. It can be known, even if we say the experience itself is eternal and has no sense of time within it, nonetheless, it's capable of being known. Known because it's experienced or known because it's experienced? Yes, know? yes, right. That's what we said. That's what we said. Yeah. Object of knowledge in the higher sense must be known. But wait a minute. <laughs> Let's see now, if there is such a thing as the one, we know one thing, we know one thing we can rest upon. It can't be many, right? If it's one, it cannot be many. Agree? Well, that's obvious. That's what makes it so nice. It can't be many. Oh, by the way, if whatever we say about it turns out to be many, well, no, we're not dealing with something we call the one, but something else. Yeah. By the way, if there is such a thing as a whole, must it not have parts? Because that's what we mean by a whole. That's what makes it that a, right? What's a whole but that, a, that which lack the, the, the totality of all its parts, the sum of all its parts. Or we can talk about it negatively and say that of which no part is lacking, either way. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if something is a whole, it must, it, then if it has parts, is that plural? Yes. Is that a many? Yes. Well, then anything that's a whole can't be the, the one. one. Oh, you're just, so just kind of... Agree? Hey, contradicted it. Now look here, this is very, look here, a unity, can it be a unity? 
wait a minute, isn't it a unity, a bunch of parts put together in a certain way that they all come? Does is that involve m many? Uh-oh, that's out. Now look here. If we can say the one, or one, one, and we can't in any way reference anything else other than itself, then can we say it's the same as something else, or is it similar to something else? Because that would involve a parts and a manyness, and some basis of making a comparison between two things. So you have to talk about, oh, we only want to talk about? One. Uh-oh. Uh oh. This is very damaging. Now we're caught in a problem. It can't be described or defined. Well, you're quite right, but we're finding something else, even though it may not be capable of being described. We know that if it is described, it's not that. Mm -hmm. right. So it can be a netty netty, not this, not this, not this, not this. Right, diva negativa, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is very embarrassing. Look here. Now, I was going to make a whole nice list for you of all of the terms, but we, we I'll just add a couple of more and you'll see. And uh, would you not agree we can say that concern, hey, when you consider this experience like any other experience, this is the greatest experience for man, isn't it? Therefore, you can say it's greater. And you can say everything else is less. Can you? Well, then you can talk about it in terms of, well, then, good heavens. If it's greater, isn't the ER making a comparison? Yes. And we said, if we have a one, and if the one is the nature of what really is, therefore, it better not be a ER or <laughs> No errs allowed in our game. <laughs> Smaller, larger, bigger, small, nothing of that, right? <laughs> Therefore, if someone insists no this is an experience of the one, we'll say, excuse me, is it greater? Than, have you noticed whether it's greater than any other experience? Oh, yes, it's great, greater means ER, comparative, yes, yes. Therefore, you can make a comparison, yes, 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 goodbye. Plurality, not a one. Oh, hmm. Well, look here. Uh, we could we could try something else. We could say, uh, could this experience be equal to some other equal to some other? What does that presuppose? The assumption behind it is that there must be two things that have a certain identity between them. That's gone. Two things, relation between them equal. Ah, oh, now this is rather peculiar. I have it. I've got it. Look here. Let's agree that this is the greatest experience. And look here, just because it's not doesn't, I mean, you examine it, we can't say it's one. Let's forget the idea of one, and let's just say this is the ultimate experience and forget this business about the good and the one. And call this the, the ultimate. Let's call the idea of the good the ultimate experience and forget about this other thing we've been doing, which is using a dialectic on it. in order to get to where we're at? Uh, well, to get to this? let's change it. So doesn't it need that progression? Let's change it then, because we, want, we can keep this. Let's keep this. Mm -hmm. This is so magnificent. Shouldn't we keep this and forget about these theoretical points? Now you're caught, you see? Now you're caught. Huh? <laughs> to the degree to which you want to say man's highest experience is an ultimate, and there's nothing beyond it, you're over here. If you say, wait a minute, do you want to say the nature of the nature, the highest nature, the thing about which we all seek is the one? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh well then this can't be one. So you're caught between the demand of reasoning and and versus experience. That tension between the two goes on and on in different systems and within ourselves when you play this game. 
Now what's startling, let's go to the next step now, what does the dialectic do? Drives you crazy. Pardon me? Drives you crazy. crazy. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course it drives you crazy. That's the whole goal. Yeah, that's the whole goal, driving you crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, the other side of that is it makes you rational and everything else is crazy. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> it's one or the other. So look here, you know what happens now? People who play this game, people who play in this game, in some way, in some way, and it's not an experience, because an experience has a beginning, a middle, and an end. They recognize the truth of this, and they say, yep, since you can't say anything about it, that's, that is really what we are after. You can only express it negatively. That's right, that's right. Only express it negatively. It's a dia negativa. All right, it's a dia negativa, All right, which is that great expression of Meister Eckhart. You can only talk about God in terms of negatives, a God seen only negatively. It's a neti neti, Sanskrit, All right, neti neti. Or in Parmenides, it's a pure one. And you don't need the word pure. When that settles into the soul of man, then he knows that this is second. And how he ever got that, it's not an experience. It's a state of mind, has no beginning, has no end. That's where the Platonic philosophy goes. And that's the dialectic. That's why you need the philosophical midwifery on the last stage, because you may think you're going nuts. You're quite right. In some sense, this is crazy. Isn't it? There's the great tension behind this because if you, you can see anyone who touched this, they want to hold on to that. And now you're going to say to them, <clears throat> excuse me, do you uh, want to play a little and talk about this grand and noble experience you've had? Good. Just one last thought. You see, if you have this, then you think you are greater. If you have this, then you think everything else must be less than you. All of the things that follow from prizing this cause many absurdities, even in the spiritual world, doesn't it? What happens then when you move from this to this? <laughs> now, things just the way they are can be seen as perfect. As the Chinese say, just so. That's the Tao, that's above the Tao. So I wanted to take you through this. I'll throw it open to questions and have some fun with you now. Yeah. Yes, please. There's a devil in a book called The Cloud of Unknowing. That's, the, that's right. That's, that's the Cloud of Unknowing. That's right. Plays havoc on theology, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And Meister Eckhart did something very important with it. He called it the Godhead. He said, I, I have it, he said. See, because if you're arguing about Trinitarian Christianity and Catholicism, and you have, that's a unity, three parts, whether they are parts or they're not, becomes a big, involved, nice theological discussion, but essentially you have a unity, however you describe it, and that's a one of a unity. So Meister Eckhart came along after this opened up to him, and he reasoned in the following way. He said, uh, oh yes, there certainly is a trinity, three parts. But you know, he says, that which unites it all, that which unites it all, must be higher than that. And the, it, the unity, the unity itself, not the unity of the three parts, but the unity itself is the Godhead. Godhead. And therefore he developed theologically a concept higher than God. And uh, famous for that, a great, great insight, tremendous insight. Yeah. Yeah. Lectures are very beautiful. Good. I have a question, if you don't mind going back a little oh, bit. Oh, any part. I lost a little bit about Pardon light. Me? I lost uh, some of the, the concepts between the light and the sun. Hmm. Could you just hmm. sort of yes. uh, okay. simplify Here, that? Yes, okay. Let me see if I can help. All right. 
there are three ways you can use the word light. All right. There, there is natural fire, light. The bulbs burning, light. There's the source of that, right, which is light. And then there is this, which just, just to put a different name on it, radiance. Those are the three different uses of the word light. All right. Now, uh, in here, you see, this experience of the nature of ultimate reality, seen as ultimate reality, called the perfection of beauty, that is called, that is called the light of being in Platonic thought. When Moses came down from the mountain, his being radiated so much that it blinded people just to look oh, at yeah, him. Yeah. In the Great Transfiguration in chapter 9 of the Gospel of Mark, yeah. right? Jesus went up in the mountain with, with uh, Peter and John and boom, uh, not John, uh, uh, Peter and, Peter, whew, Peter and, Peter? why did I forget Peter the third name? No, no, Peter and, what? Mark? No, no, Mark wasn't a disciple. Ah, forget. Ah, what a thing to forget. In any case, he went up to the mountain, had transfiguration experience, out of which both Moses and Elijah emerged. Yeah. Right. And that's called the great transfiguration experience, very similar. Both are mountains, both the transfiguration light. This is the light of being. It's called the transfiguration light. This is the divine light. And the image, therefore, you see, an analogy is, you see, the analogy would be, if our light presupposes the sun, so too the light of being or radiance presupposes something that must be the source of that. As the sun is the source of our visible light, so this divine radiance must have a, must have a that's right. And that's called the good, or the one. That's the king and queen. This is the queen. The queen then gives birth to both of these, as well as truth and reason. What's the queen again now? Pardon me? What's her name again? The queen? The king is over there. Yeah. This yeah. is the queen. This is the king. Gives birth to truth and reason. And in the, wor in the world of mind, he gives birth to truth and reason. In the, in the visible world, in the, in, in the visible world, uh, the she, or the divine right radiance, gives birth to the sun and to the light. Oh, okay. So the curious thing, as we all know, is that, that uh, no one ever experiences light. Well, no one knows what they're talking about in the everyday world. Agree? Because, like right now, to see that wall, I'm able to see the wall, or a picture on that wall. And, and would you not agree there's light here? But do I ever experience directly this, or do I experience that? And therefore, no one ever experienced light in itself. Therefore, the only people who really know what they're talking about when they talk about light are people who have this experience. We infer the presence of this because things are visible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If someone says, I see light, you can say, excuse me, uh, excuse me. When you hear, would you agree, you, you don't hear words, you hear sounds, and from sounds you infer the presence of words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the only thing you ever hear are what? Sounds. Sounds, yeah. In the same way, by the way, you could say, uh, is the only thing you ever see colors? Yeah, the only thing you ever see is colors. You infer something has the colors, but the only thing you ever see is colors. So if someone says they see light, you can say, excuse me, what color did it have? Right? And if they can't tell you, you'd say, excuse me, as much as I like you, we're friends and all that, but you, something wrong with what you're saying. 
right? Because if you experience it, you should be able to then talk about it. And if you see light, it should have a color. And if you see the color that doesn't have any object, excuse me, I suggest maybe you should stop drinking. Yeah, you know. There's a big argument. <laughs> <laughs> or some, some good advice like that. They're arguing whether the light comes from the retina or whether it comes from the object. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and the fun of it is, if they push that image a step further, they never see the light anyhow. It's an image in the mind. They got a candle in the mind or something? They turn on lights? <laughs> so you have a lot of fun with it, the irony of this, please, position. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. I wanted to I'll take more questions, of course, if you have them. But this is what I wanted to take through. And that's how I see philosophy in the present. Therefore, we have another one for the future, but this is the problem. Yeah. So we never experience the one in and of It's not an experience. No, no. Uh, it's not that we never experience it. It cannot be an experience because an experience has a point of origin. It has a closure. Right? You can reflect on it. It has something you can describe. Therefore, if there's something beyond the most ultimate experience, it itself cannot be an experience. There's no beginning and no end. No beginning and end. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, with no begin, with no end, then does that mean that one doesn't? And what do I want to say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Do it though. Okay. With no beginning and no end, yet there's an ascent and a descent. Right? Didn't we establish that? With the descent, then would one have to give birth all over again? Because we cannot. Save the, yes. Because uh, we cannot retain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. This, whatever it is that we. That no. We, no. Uh, this you don't have to worry about retaining. Because it can't be retained. Right. It can't be retained. And it can't be lost. And it can't be lost. <laughs> can't lose it. So it can't be. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it doesn't take a blade of grass. It's cheap. So it right. It's cheap. You don't even have to feed it. Can or can't be regained. It, no, no, if it can't be lost, you don't have to worry about regaining it. So this, going back to the soul and the pregnant soul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, forget about the experience. Yeah, I yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> back in our model. Back, All right. back at the, the pregnant soul uh, mode, once that soul has given birth, because with the help of the midwife, yeah. then is that then a, a mature soul? Or just a soul that's been a, a sort of awakened. Well, the, the latter. Oh yes, the latter. It's it's an awakening of the soul. Oh yes, profound awakening. Yeah. yeah. So that does. So does that imply that that soul needn't ever be that it will never regress? Well, so you can only regress from things that you lose. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one you can't, there's, it doesn't have that quality of being grasped, so it can't be lost. Agree? Mm -hmm. Isn't that curious? It follows, doesn't it, though it's rather curious? Mm -hmm. Agree? You cannot regress unless you're someplace. If this can't be described as a place, no regression. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not moving forward or back. It's just it, just, it's just there. Yeah. And you said that an experience has a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. But you're also, it, it's also indicating that these people stay in that state. What state? In, Which? In that radiance or that experience of luminosity. The quote is that some people desire to stay in that state, which he doesn't want to allow in his republic, yes. Is that, is, does that mean that it has a beginning, middle, and end? It sounds that like means, it's always as there. As far as they are concerned, it had a beginning, and they want to continue it. They want more of that line. They want it to go on, don't they? They don't want it to stop. Otherwise. They don't want it to stop. <laughs> so does that mean that it doesn't stop for them? No, it means when they drop dead, it's over. If they're lucky enough to keep it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it had an end seven, right? Had, oh, see, I see. It had see, the The most astonishing thing in this whole interesting game 
is one statement that all of these people make again and again. And it's most irritating. Oh my God, it's there all the time, I didn't recognize it. It was there all the time, I didn't recognize it. Oh, oh I realize I never should have left home, it was here all the time. <laughs> oh my heavens, I forgot that at the, when I, good heavens, I forgot that at the very center of our house, the hearth of our house, when I, I just could have dug up those rocks and there's the great treasure. It was right there all along. <coughs> all of the myths deal with the same thing. And that has to follow, doesn't it? Otherwise it would have a beginning. So therefore, what's nice about this, this is the only system that's really, really pleasant. And I think you'll agree once, once I say this. Ready? All right, here it comes. It has to be obvious. Agree? It has to be obvious. Mm -hmm. And it has to be obvious that you've never been apart from it, you just didn't recognize. Is that because of reason? Pardon? Is that because of reason? No. Is that because of reason? Or yes and no. Logic, I guess. Yes and no. If I talk more about it, I'll open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you have to say more about it, right? Yes, it is because of reason or logic. What is? Is it our an inability to recognize the obvious? Is that be because? Of just because our logic misconstrues no. it? No. no. Oh, because we haven't, been, we haven't no. given birth. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think it is. If you, I'll make, give you a personal reflection. I, what I think it is, I think man's condition is rather simple. Uh, he's got three things he thinks he knows. And we played with one of them. He thinks he knows what he's talking about when he talks about light. And the second... He thinks he knows what he means when he says, I experience things in my mind. And he goes a step further and he says, things are different than I am. But in the the way we developed it, he has no experience of life. Totally, totally, totally misunderstands the nature of experience. You would agree with that? Took it just a few minutes to reflect on it? Well, uh, here you can see, as you can see, right? Uh, some fish. Now look here. The same thing is going to be said about the one will be said about the other, right? Now look here. Here you can see a beautiful bowl in which water and the fish are in. Would you not agree it would be absurd if someone were to come to us and to say, you know, I saw some fish swimming around and if we were to say, excuse me, what did you see the fish in the water are in. They say, well, nothing, they just fish were just swimming around. <laughs> you say, excuse me, fish just don't swim around. Where, did, where were they swimming? Oh, they're just, they're just swimming. Okay, next up, suppose you were to say, are you thinking about the goldfish that were on my dresser table? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't see any uh, bowl. You'd say, excuse me, would you go back and please take a look and see whether or not you could see the goldfish bowl in which the fish in the water are in? see him again. He says, hey, you know what? I did that. I saw the fish in the water and on the dresser, but I didn't see the bowl. <laughs> what would you tell him at this point? <laughs> I'll talk about something else. Talk about something else? Because you're not going to get through that cookie, are you? I mean, he's not going to understand anything. <laughs> agree? Look, but look. But look. Look here. What's the difference between that statement and this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would it not follow that if people make that statement, they should have some experience about this mm -hmm. and know what they're talking about? Mm -hmm. They should be able to describe it. They should be able to describe that it is their mind. Right. And in some way, there's this that does this in here, and they possess it. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no. 
what happens when you try to ask someone to explore the way we are, that statement? Do they look for the door? Do they say, excuse me, I think I'll go and have a walk, I think I'm going to get a cup of coffee, or, or do they sit and engage? They're very frustrating, isn't it, to keep someone on? That's right. People get very upset when you question those. Now try this one. The next one is worse. Would you agree they're things? No, no, no. By the way, if they're different, if you call them things because they're different than you, I imagine you can describe the difference between a thing and you. Well, first start on the I. Would that cause some troubles? Because we, all right, I don't know. These three things are the problem. So long as we think we know what we're talking about, uh, that's our problem. That's our problem. Going back to what we just read, the assumptions we make, see, the assumptions we make block us. The dialectic identifies these assumptions, undermines them, so therefore they put into doubt and hopefully you're not able to use them. That causes frustration. If you continue without frustration long enough, you might get into uh, a nice recollection that you were in a pretty good place all along and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where all the paradoxes. This is what Alan Watts has so much fun with, this very point, doesn't it? I mean, every talk Alan Watts ever had is nothing other than this one. You know, man, mankind is rather curious. Mankind goes around and he thinks he's stupid and he doesn't realize he's wise. And his only wisdom is when he recognizes that he was ignorant all the time and didn't know it. And so you can make all kinds of playful points about this very idea. And so that's what I think philosophy really is in the present. And why do I think it's in the present? Because that's what I do. And I'm in the present. Good point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.